Disclaimer. Judge Ron Rangel is providing this podcast and website for educational purposes only, as well as to give the public general information regarding topics related to the criminal justice system. The views, thoughts, and opinions of his guest speakers are the speaker's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Judge Rangel. All rise. You are now listening to Beyond the Gavel with Judge Ron Rangel, educating the public and expanding mindsets. Subscribe on our website, beyondthegavelpodcast.com, or your favorite podcast platform for more of the latest podcast episodes and updates. Welcome to Beyond the Gavel with Judge Ron Rangel. I'm your host. Today in the studio, we have Jim Tochi. Jim, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Judge. Thank you so much for coming in. I just want to ask you a couple questions about yourself so folks know who it is that you are, why you're here with us today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Jim? I'm a native San Antonian, as we don't like leaving this place. And, Homegrown. And I understand why. Born and raised, went to high school here, went to uh, college in Austin, graduated from UT here in San Antonio, and then went out to Lubbock for law school. Had a great, great time out there. Everybody always wonders how that was, and I loved it. Came back around 1999, got licensed, and became a prosecutor at the Bear County DA's office. Really enjoyed that experience. I was there for almost eight years. Left that position in 2007. I've been in private practice doing criminal defense work for about the last 16 years. Practicing primarily here in San Antonio. However, I've pretty much been statewide, kind of been everywhere and and seen a lot, but San Antonio's home, and I, I love it here. How long have you been a lawyer? I'm in my 25th year of law practice and have dabbled in a couple other things, but I'd say 24 of the 25 have been devoted to uh, criminal law. Now you're also a part-time magistrate here. That is correct, yes, sir. What does that mean? I work on a part-time basis, usually two to three times a month at various points. You know, magistration is a 24-hour process. There has to be a magistrate there 24-7, 365. So we work at uh, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon, and of course, sometimes overnight. But our basic responsibilities are to be there to handle and help with the processing of individuals that get arrested. But we also do a myriad of other things. We're signing search warrants, we're signing arrest warrants, making sure that the system is running smoothly and functioning the way it should, making sure that everyone's doing their job. We talked to Lauren Lefton last episode regarding magistration and the process that they do at the city. The one thing we didn't focus too much with Lauren was the actual setting of bail. And that's because the city of San Antonio doesn't set bail for arrestees, only county magistrates do. Is that right? Correct. And you work with the county, which means you were appointed by the district judges, the criminal district judges in Bear County, but you're presided over there by a presiding judge named Celeste Ramita. Yes, Celeste is, is our chief supervisor. So let's just focus a little bit on bail. It's sort of a hot topic right now. There's some stuff going on in San Antonio where I've been asked a lot by media outlets how Bell works. How specifically does Bell work in a nutshell for those that are listening in? Well, there's a lot of things that go into a, a bail decision. As magistrates, the first thing, the, the first piece of information we get is we get the file. And the file usually consists of a police report. It may have an arrest warrant affidavit. You're not given a a full and complete discovery of the case before you, but you're given enough information to know why that individual is there. After that, the only other thing that we're really provided is what is known as a PSR. It is a report that is given to us on every individual that comes before us that tells us about his entire body of criminal history, not only in Bear County or the state of Texas, but as far away as California, as far away as New York, even Hawaii. Uh, and those are, that is a very, very important instrument that we use after reading the offense report and determining bail. After we read through the report and give a close analysis of their criminal history and background, that is basically how we arrive at the bail decision. You have to take into account the severity of the offense that they're there for. Is it a minor property crime? Is there a victim? Or is this a more serious felony? Did somebody get hurt, either with a weapon, with a vehicle, things of that nature? 
And so you have to take all that into account in arriving at an appropriate bail decision. It's not always easy to do. You get a feel for it as time goes by, but there's a lot of things you have to take into account, especially the safety of the community when we're talking about violent offenders, without, without a doubt. There's been talk locally about violent repeat offenders getting low bail. We went through, we analyzed the actual bail amounts that have been set in Bear County through county magistrates. And the reality of it is, is that back when we had bail schedules, do you remember the bell schedules? I do, yes. Yeah, and the bell schedules were considered to be unconstitutional in a, in a big case called O'Donnell, which came out of Harris County or Houston. The bell schedules would recommend certain specific amounts for magistrates to use as a guide, but once they were done away with, there has been no guide since then. So magistrates are really using their own best judgment when they look at these kinds of things. You know, some of the things that, that I've already discussed are kind of our, our guiding rod in, into what we think is an appropriate bail. And even amongst the magistrates, and there's about 15, I think there are three full-time mm -hmm. and 12 part-time magistrates. You know, we're all individuals and, and we all view the people before us uh, differently. However, there is an emphasis in setting magistration that violent offenders are always likely to get a much more higher bond. And there's an obvious reason. Uh, anytime you have a victim of crime, the bond is usually going to get set higher. And if they have a history uh, where they have victimized others before, that likely to is to further increase the bond. Mm -hmm. uh, are you going to have situations where somebody has been accused of a, a victim crime in the past that may seemingly get a low bond. I'm sure that's likely to happen. One thing you got to look at too, is you may have somebody that comes before you. They may have been arrested three times before for a misdemeanor assault, but they've never been convicted. It's kind of difficult. How do, how do you I hold that against him? Uh, is it a situation where I feel maybe this person got away with something because the victim didn't want to come forward or he had a hand in it? You have to think about those things. You have to evaluate those things. And sometimes you even have to kind of look into it to try and find out, uh, is that what was going on? It's very hard to do because you don't have the resources or access to that information. So a lot of times you have to make the best call that you can. I feel very comfortable in the judgments that I make and the bonds that I set. And if I don't, I'm sure I'll hear about it and knock on wood. So, so far, so good. But, but yeah, bonds have been a hot topic issue for the last five years plus years for sure and, and likely will probably continue to be. Some of the things that we've learned is that the actual bail amounts that have been set by county magistrates since we've gotten away with the bail schedules in 2018 are actually higher on violent type offenses or charges. And so there's this concept somehow or another that the reform policies that were instituted by our current district attorney somehow or another has depressed the bond amounts of magistrates that have gone before the county mags. What do you think about that? I, you know, like I said, we, we don't, you know, we don't discuss cases with the DA. There are prosecutors that are there in case questions arise and they do make bond recommendations. But I think that the things that we utilize in setting bond never change. And those are the things that guide us each and every time we have somebody that come before us. There's going to be a lot written in the media about the, the DA, whoever it is, at whatever time it is. And this will always be an issue. It's always been an issue since I've been in practice. And years ago, it seemed like bond practices were oppressive. When I became a magistrate, I remember that was the issue. I remember that larger jurisdictions were being sued because their bond practices were oppressive. And there was an emphasis not to lower bonds across the board, but just to make sure that we're paying attention and setting bonds in an appropriate manner. And so I try to do that with everybody that comes in front of me. I believe all my colleagues at the magistrate office do the same thing. We don't really involve ourselves in the politics or what is being said about any particular individual organization, entity, or case and just always try to be the right thing. The bond amounts on homicide cases is actually twice as high as what they were when bell schedules existed. So I think those kind of things are important to talk about. Well, let's talk about other things. You're a criminal defense attorney, so there's a lot that you know about the practice of law. At this point, I'd, li I'd like to think so, but it, I'm learning new stuff every day. It amazes <laughs> me. I tell my kids every day you learn something. What's it like to be a criminal defense attorney? 
very interesting. A lot of people always ask me about the work I do and the people I encounter and cases that I deal with. And I usually have a stock answer and I'm like, do you really want to talk about this? Or, or trust me, you don't really want to hear about it. You know, each day truly is different. While you may handle the same case over and over, there's a lot of nuance and different facts and a different person. And so I truly enjoy each day I come down to the office. Uh, like any other job, it, it definitely has its ups and downs. Uh, you can have a very difficult case. You can have a very difficult client. You could be dealing with a very difficult prosecutor or, or my favorite, you're dealing with all three at one time and, and that often happens. But you learn what you're doing in 25 years of law practice. I won't say it gets a little easier, but you get better at managing it and you get better at managing expectations. And as time goes by, you learn how to get things done. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. And that's all I kind of try to do with each and every client that, that I deal with. In the United States, we have something called the adversarial system, right? Yes. And so the adversarial system means you have two sides. You have the state and the defense. They have an opportunity to review the case files, to review the evidence that has come in, to independently investigate and to look things up like maybe we need to hire an expert. We need to figure out what we need to do to represent our side. And so the way the adversarial system works is both sides give it their all. In the end, you have a neutral and detached fair judge. You get justice. That's the ideal. That That's the ideal. And, and I would say the vast majority of the times, that's usually how things play out. You know, what funny thing that I always encounter when I, when I talk to people that are non-lawyers, they always tell me what a great lawyer they would be. Mm -hmm. And they always say the same thing. Uh, and, and the reason they would become a, you know, be a great lawyer is because they think they're good at arguing or they're wonderful at arguing. And I always tell them, look, but I think what kind of makes me the best at what I do is trying not to be adversarial. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I need to get, you know, down and dirty, as you've seen before many times in jury trials with me, I'm, I'm willing to do that. And I'm quite capable in fights, but I feel that fighting, and I think a lot of lawyers have adopted that mantra. Not all. There are some lawyers that just love to fight. They come in and they yell and scream and that adversary system you talked about, mm -hmm. it comes into full focus for them each and every time. It really just is a lawyer by lawyer thing. Essentially what you're telling us is that every case is different. You have to figure out the strengths and weaknesses of whatever case it is that you're dealing with, figure out the best course of action. Sometimes a plea may be the best thing that could happen for you and for the state. Sometimes a case needs to be tried. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The, the first thing I do when I receive all my discovery, which sometimes can be a chore in and of itself, it, just getting all the information on a case, you break it down. You literally have to read each and every report. You have to watch each and every video, depending on what kind of case it is. And once you get all the information and assimilate it, you develop a game plan, you develop a strategy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that works hand in hand with the client. Some clients don't want to really talk about their case. Mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly enough, you would think they would be very interested in the case and the discussion and what direction we're going to go. But a lot of times they just hand the ball to you and say, look, you're the lawyer, you decide what we're going to do. And I'm okay with that. But to be honest, I like the client to be involved in it too. And after that, yeah, we develop that game plan and try to execute it. Uh, sometimes it will result in a plea bargain if we both agree that's going to be in the best interest. Sometimes we'll dig in and fight. And a lot of times my clients won't agree with the proposed strategy I have. And that's fine. It's their life. It's their case. Whatever the situation is, I just try to do the best I can for them. Now, you mentioned discovery. Yes. It, you mentioned discovery. What exactly does that mean? Discovery is a process that is in our our law it's in the in the code of criminal procedure now it is basically an obligation that's been placed on the prosecuting attorney and their office to turn over any and all information that they have on any pending criminal matter mm -hmm. discovery generally is going to be mostly written police reports or videos or photographs, but discovery comes in, in a very wide array of information. Uh, a lot of it is forensic examination. There's, there's DNA evidence, uh, fingerprint evidence, basically anything that is in the possession of the state that they intend to use or just have and may not intend to use it, they are obligated to give it over to me so I can analyze it as well in formulating my defense for my client. And the amount of discovery that exists in cases today is much more than it was just a few years ago. It, it has 
increased exponentially. And that's just one of, you know, one of the excesses of technology. Almost every police department and unit, even the smaller ones here in town, I believe they all have body worn cameras. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first started, most statements that you would receive would be in written form. You rarely see that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, most statements are usually taken in audio recorded form on a body worn camera. And, and yes, I cannot begin to tell you the volume of discovery i will get cases where there are i have a case pending right now that has over 350 different videos mm -hmm. just on that one case it is an extreme amount of information that is now coming in then you think about things like cameras or ring type video that is on people's front doors where let's say there's a crime that was committed in a neighborhood then the police or somebody goes through and looks for that type of video information that could be in existence that could have captured something. You get that a lot. And interestingly enough, I'm glad you brought that up. I have found that that works more for the defense mm -hmm. than it does for, for the prosecutors. For that very reason, most people do have cameras at their home now. That kind of technology is very inexpensive now. I don't think people get it for the purpose of protecting themselves in a in a criminal prosecution, but I can't tell you how many times I've had my clients come forward and say, look at this, look what the police did. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's great. Uh, Ring's huge right now. It's a lot of it's out there. Then there's a lot of other information that exists on social media, things like Facebook or Instagram or these other types of social media platforms where individuals use them to post whatever it is that state and the defense has to go through and look at and review and see what evidence exists there. One of the first things we do when we, we get a new client, depending on the context of the case, is usually uh, start searching through social media, not only on our client, but if it is uh, a client that we have and there is a victim and the client is indicating that the victim is uh, being less than truth for lying or, or made the whole thing up, oftentimes we have and can go to their social media. And in this day and age, if you're between the ages of 18 and 35, uh, you'd be surprised at what most people are going to be posting and having. And we have found a plethora of information that we have found very useful in court. Uh, you know, just to share with the other side who may think that this is a, a God-fearing and really super honest person and you show them information and, and uh, oftentimes it changes their mind. What are some bits of information on social media that you've come across that maybe is interesting that you've been able to use in a case that's been a benefit for you? We had a case one time where a girl was basically soliciting uh, sex for money on one of her social media platforms, which of course is a crime in and of itself. Uh -huh. You know, oftentimes we will have complaining witnesses or just witnesses or victims. They love taking photographs of them with illicit substances, mm -hmm. smoking marijuana, flashing weaponry or handguns, usually a combination of drugs and guns. And it just kind of gives you a little snapshot into the potential of their character. And so when you read a cold file and you think, wow, I feel really bad for this person and you share that information with the other side should change you know, your viewpoint of that person. And then we've had circumstances where people would say, and I've seen this in court where somebody says, I've never used a gun before. I don't know what guns look like. I've never handled a weapon. And here comes the Facebook pictures from a few years ago where they're flashing some guns. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm old school. I'm, I'm 52 years old. I was before Twitter and Facebook uh -huh. and I, you know, and probably I think for the better, I've never really subscribed or been, been into social media platforms. It served me well. And so I have a good understanding of it. 52 years old, huh? Yes, sir. You're a baby <laughs> growing up. Not On the topic of information that is available and discovery, you also got to look at things like cell phone use. Texts, texts frequently come into court. Somebody's phone records. I'm hearing a lot of this lately where the police is confiscating someone's phone for whatever reason as part of an investigation and separate and apart for the reason of the investigation, they're finding things like child pornography on those phones. Yeah. Yeah. Cell phones, again, you know, one of the excesses of technology. And I mean, obviously, as I have learned uh, handling these cases and in dealing with what we refer to as phone dumps. Uh, a phone dump is a forensic examination of a cell phone. And, you know, people that think you can hit the delete button on a text message or a photograph on your phone and it's gone, trust me, nothing is ever gone. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that phone dump is going to capture every single thing you've ever searched, every photo you've taken, every text you've ever sent. Mm -hmm. And if you think you've deleted it, nobody can ever see it or find it. Uh, that is incorrect. And yes, we do see uh, a lot of that. Let's face it, on our cell phones, could you just imagine what, what kind of information you're going to find in a, in a person's cell phone? Mm -hmm. it's scary to think about. Something like uh, people's locations and whereabouts. There have been a lot of crimes uh, that have been alleged wherein the police or investigators come in and they say, we analyzed the GPS on somebody's phone. We did something called triangulation. We figured out that they were at this location where this homicide was committed. Yes. I mean, cell phones now, it, it's a personal GPS, just, mm -hmm. just like you said, and that is a technology that the police have been using for years now, and they can almost uh, pinpoint uh, every movement you've made within a period of time by that, by that triangulation method, because most people yeah, take their phones with them, and so you, you have a GPS with you at all times. Then you have other types of evidence, like scientific evidence. Let's say you have the homicide or you have, like, let's say, a driving while intoxicated, which results in somebody's death. Medical examiners that come in and, and talk about information related to manner and means of death and reports that they've done. There's all sorts of reports that you, as a defense attorney, would get during that discovery continues to make that process much more cumbersome. It can. It can also be very helpful. And this is probably what most people watch on TV. There are, you know, probably 150 different shows related to fingerprints and DNA. And there's there's one just all about bones that I saw the other day that I found to be particularly ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, that's the part of our job. Uh, and, and oftentimes it, we, we've been able to use that forensic evidence to, to our benefit. It does tell a story. Uh, whether you like the story or not, I mean, you don't really get to decide that, but that's the kind of hard evidence it's, as it's referred to that really can't lie. There's going to be blood somewhere and it's going to belong to a person. I suppose you can talk about how it got there, but th those things have definitely uh, come to the forefront in criminal prosecutions for both sides. They can be helpful to prosecute somebody. They can certainly be helpful to, to defend somebody that may not may not be guilty. I'm having a great conversation here with Jim Tochi. Let's do a quick Q&A break. We'll be right back. This is Q&A with Judge Ron Rangel. Submit your question today at beyondthegavelpodcast.com. Welcome to the Q&A break. We have a question. Oh, this is an interesting question. When you were an attorney, did you like it? What made you want to become a judge? Well, let me ask you, Jim. You're an attorney. Do you like it? I do. I, I very much enjoy what I do. I, I didn't think that I would, you know, when you're younger and you don't know anything and you don't know where you're going to end up, or is this even going to work out? You just don't have the answers to those questions. But now kind of uh, where I am in my professional career, I very much enjoy it. I work for myself. My work is never the same. I, I have an opportunity while I make, you know, decent money. I have an opportunity to help people. Mm -hmm. um, and that truly is the, the real benefit of what I do. And help comes in many different ways and shapes and forms. But uh, I truly enjoy helping these people at some of the darkest times of their life. I really enjoyed being a lawyer. I loved being a prosecutor because for me, it was all about the jury trial. And I really loved helping people, just like you're saying, Jim. It was a really good feeling to feel like you could make a difference in people's lives. And I really loved it quite a bit. I wanted to run for judge because I always knew that I wanted to work in the public realm somehow, right? I always knew that I wanted to run for something. When I was younger, I thought I would want to run for Congress. For those of you that have listened to this podcast, you know that I've always been someone who's always been concerned about issues related to civil rights and any type of discrimination whatsoever towards any person. And so for me, running for judge allowed me to get into that particular public realm and try to look at it from the political side as well as from the legal side. Thank you so much for asking that question. That was a fun one. Please continue to write those questions in. We enjoy answering them for you. We'll be right back. This is Q&A with Judge Ron Rangel. Submit your question today at beyondthegavelpodcast.com. Welcome back. I'm here talking to Jim Tochi. So are there circumstances where maybe you have a client who's charged with a high-profile case and it sounds really ugly in the media 
And once you start getting into the discovery process, you recognize that maybe the state's case isn't quite as strong as been initially laid out. And as a result of that, it's easier for you to negotiate a plea deal. Yeah. I mean, I kind of have a rule Mm -hmm. and my paralegal, she enjoys reading those stories. I don't like reading them. I, I, you know, nothing against the media itself, but I generally find that media stories are largely inaccurate uh, in terms of what the case involves. But yeah, sometimes when you dig into the nitty gritty of a high profile case or a very serious case, and you come to find out there are a lot of issues with it and the evidence does not really seem to suggest or point in the direction of, of your client. You know, when that happens, got to sit down with your client, and figure out what are we going to do now? And I've been attacked. Really, every judge has been attacked for plea bargains that have come before them where the two parties agree that this is the appropriate sentence in this particular case on, on a case where maybe on its face it sounds heinous, sounds really bad. But after the parties have had an opportunity to exchange discovery and do an investigation, they realize there could be some issues regarding taking this case to trial. Have you been involved in those kind of circumstances? Many times. And, you know, that kind of ties back into any story that the media might publish that when you read the headline, it can sound salacious or inflammatory. But they don't understand, like you pointed out, the two individuals that are in the best spot to determine the merits and strengths and weaknesses of the case are the two lawyers, the defense lawyer and the prosecutor. The judge has no role in the negotiation. The judge doesn't even know anything about the allegations. All the judge knows is there exists an indictment and the judge will listen to and respond to any issues or motions that are brought forward by the parties. But the parties are the one that know their cases. They're the ones that have talked to the witnesses. And so any time, and I was taught a long time ago uh, when I was a baby, be lawyer in the DA's office. While judges can and do bust pleas, I learned that two parties that know what the case is worth is generally the two lawyers involved. But I can certainly understand how when the story is written, they don't account for that. The public isn't given all of the information. They haven't read the entire report. They haven't sat across from the table from these witnesses and heard what they had to say. It, and it's a complicating system. So people, generally speaking, don't quite always understand exactly how things are arrived at in the courtroom. I think they watch a lot of TV. When I pick juries, one of the first things I always dispel them about is if you're one of these people that watches TV a lot and you love CSI and you love Law and Order, those are great shows, but that's not real life. That's not the real courtroom. It's 20 times longer than an hour. And it's just not like that. You have to understand this is real life. Another interesting issue for me related to this topic, oftentimes when you read an article or you see something on TV and it talks about a sentence, it'll say something like, there's an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon that was committed. A person was sentenced to 20 years. They'll be eligible for parole in half the term. So then people start writing in, oh my God, this person's going to get out of prison in 10 years. What are your thoughts on that? I can certainly see how they might read that and think that as you're well aware, TV CDC publishes these numbers. They're available for public consumption. Aggravated offenders or anyone convicted of what is referred to as a 3G offense, they're generally going to serve the vast majority of their sentence. Is somebody eligible for parole in 10 years on an aggravated assault? Yes, they are. Is, you know, are they likely to gain that parole? Statistically, no. I think TDC, I don't know where the numbers are right now, but my understanding in recent past, TDC is generally holding aggravated offenders close to 80 to 90% of their sentence mm -hmm. in general. Do some people get out earlier? Of course they do. Do some people serve all 20 years? Yes. You know, the bigger question is when you read aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, it just, that's a very big menacing concept. You know, I don't think some people realize that, uh, let's say you get into a fight over a cell phone at a bus stop and somebody pulls out a pocket knife less than two inches that they may have bought at a convenience store that might technically qualify as, as a deadly weapon. And again, you, you don't really know the facts and circumstances. All you knows you hear aggravated assault and your mind goes to a maybe an AK-47 and something menacing. And a lot of times it really has nothing to do with anything like that. We're talking about parole and when folks get released and you mentioned TDC, that's a Texas Department of Corrections. Those are individuals at TDC that make those parole decisions appointed by the governor. 
Right. And so you mentioned that they published those numbers. Um, do you have any idea where anybody could find that information if there were interest? I'm sure if you went to the Texas Department of Corrections website, I'm sure they have a drop down box mm -hmm. where you could find some public database information about offenders. I know that you could go on there and find it any individual offender and where they're located and what they're serving their sentence for. They probably have information on their website about things like that. Statistically, how long they're holding offenders, how long somebody remains in custody and when they actually get released. So that information is out there. You just got to be savvy enough to look for it and find it. We're talking about how offenses that are listed within the Texas Penal Code are written very, very broadly to capture a large type of act that could fall within a particular offense charge. I think of something like robbery. We could have a robbery where somebody punches another person in the face and takes their purse. But a robbery is also a, a situation where somebody could be shoplifting $5 worth of something at HEB. And as they're walking out, a security guard will try to stop them. They'll push by. That could also have the same range of punishment. You can. We were talking about discovery earlier, right? All the information that is now available, uh, most of it is a result of technology and where we're at in this day and age. How long does it take to get things like DNA evidence or to get all of the video that could exist through the body cams that the police officers wear? Again, it depends on the case. If we're talking about a major felony where you have 15, 20, 30 police officers responding to a crime scene, that's going to take a long time. You're not likely to receive all the video and all the discovery for at least three to six months. And oftentimes what you'll see in especially the larger cases is the DA's office doesn't even have the discovery. SAPD has their own technology within which they feed the DA's office the discovery. So I will get hired on a case and it will have been pending for a year and a half. And the week before a, tr a trial setting, I'll get 50 more videos. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the DA's office didn't even have it. That usually happens in a vast majority of cases. You're getting ready for trial and all of the sudden you're getting some late crucial discovery. Not an item that's not going to matter, but a significant item that may impact the outcome of a jury trial. That's a very common thing that we see in the courts, right? A case could be pending. Let's say it's nine months, 10 months. I'm trying to call the case for trial. While the parties come up and say, we just got discovery from the San Antonio Police Department yesterday or today, and we're turning it over to the defense today. What do you think that issue is? Is it truly just a two systems that don't connect between SAPD and the district attorney's office? It's hard for me to say because I don't know the inner workings of the DA's discovery process. Right. I had a case just two weeks ago. It was a murder case. We were set to go. And the week before, the prosecutor called me and told me they had two of those cell phone dumps that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Cell phone dump is a massive amount of information. And one of the cell phones belonged to the complainant, the deceased complainant. The other one belonged to my client. And mm -hmm. Lord knows there could be a plethora of information in either one of those. And it was explained that it just wasn't sent, Wh whatever that means. I mean, it means it wasn't sent. How there was that breakdown in communication and such crucial information, I don't know. I've had it happen many, many times, oftentimes with cell phone dump. I don't know where the breakdown is. And I would think after now moving in, you know, we've been doing e-discovery now for about five, six years. Mm -hmm. uh, you would think these issues would start to get worked out, but I, I don't think they are. I think there is a new system that they're trying to work on mm -hmm. to streamline these issues. It's not here yet. I mean, I don't fault the prosecutors. Uh, there's about a couple instances where I think they've been a little bit lax about looking. Mm -hmm. I think primarily it's the police not getting them the information. You talked about e-discovery. We know that the district attorney is a county official, so works within the confines of whatever the county oper operation is. The city of San Antonio deals with SAPD. They have two unique systems, and so for them to come together sometimes could be a little problematic when it comes to exchanging information. It could be. It, it could be like the CIA and the FBI. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've, I've never been in one of those organizations, but my understanding is they don't really like each other. <laughs> they don't like sharing information with each other. I don't think that kind of 
relationship or tension exists between the two, they have such a symbiotic relationship. And, right. and so it would make sense that they would streamline that operation, not only for SAPD and the DA's office, but for us too, in the proper administration of justice. Uh, this does happen a lot. So, so what you're saying then is the state is required to give you all the information that they have on a case to allow you to properly prepare for trial. Yes. Are you able to go to the police yourself and say, there is some information that you have not had an opportunity for whatever reason to pass on to the district attorney's office. Can you provide it to me and I'll then provide it to the state? We've tried that. Uh -huh. And they, uh, no, they are not going to direct file with the defense lawyer, any evidence or information that exists on a case. We've, we've tried contacting detectives before we become aware of discovery issue and understand the prosecutors don't have this information. So we go directly to the police and what they tell us is they will contact somebody at the DA's office to get the proper flow of information going. So no, we cannot go to the to the detectives or SAPD and say, hey, will you give us this information? We know it exists. It has to go to the DA's office and then come to us. All right. So when you've tried to do that, has that caused the case that you're working on to be delayed within the court system? Absolutely. Let's say you're preparing for trial. You get information from the district attorney's office and it's favorable to your client. In your opinion, you think we have a case here that if we take it to trial, you could have some success. Does that automatically mean then that that case will be dismissed or that you'll be successful at trial? And how do you advise your client as to those types of issues? Definitely doesn't mean that the DAs are just going to dismiss it. Uh, sometimes I would say maybe in 10% of, of the Brady notices, that's what it's called. It's a Brady notice. It's, it's information that's, that's exculpatory to your client, whether it relates to guilt, innocence, or punishment. But most times it does not necessarily get you to a dismissal. A lot of times though, it creates leverage, leverage to get something that you may want in plea negotiations. What I do with my clients is let them know. I sit down and go over the Brady notice with them and it may relate to a crucial witness's testimony. It may be Brady, but it may not be crucial. It may not affect the outcome of a trial. You just have to analyze and figure out how this Brady helps. Will it help? Do we want to alter course or do we now want to try to create leverage? It really is different across the board, but sometimes the I got one not that long ago. It was attempted capital murder and this Brady that I got killed the case. So that does happen. And sometimes it happens in larger cases. Now you're a family man. Two, two daughters, 10 and eight, keeping me young. Uh-huh. Ish. Yeah. <laughs> Your wife's an attorney. Yes. So what do y'all do for fun? She likes going to home goods and Marshalls, and uh, I like traveling out of state for golf. So. Uh -huh. What's your handicap? I'm playing to about a seven, about a seven right now. Wow. My, my game's dwindling though. It, wow. it, I don't play as much as I, my kids are getting older. Right. And as your kids get older, your time, there's an exponential relationship, mm -hmm. an inverse relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but no, we, you know, we make it work. They're at the age now where they've become work. It's a labor of love. My daughters are amazing. I love them to death. Mm -hmm. and, my, and my wife is too. She's, uh, she's a great mother. Right. She, she works down here in this building. I am blessed for yes. sure. Don't feel I deserve it, but I'll, I'll take every bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim, I've enjoyed having this conversation with you. Likewise. Are there any last words that you would have for our listeners? I, I guess in, in closing, you know, tying to the things that we were talking about today, I would just tell, you know, anybody listening to this, just understand uh, that our, our system of justice, uh, like any other system, uh, it's certainly not perfect. It's certainly not infallible, but it, it's, you know, people like Judge Ron Hill and a lot of the lawyers and a lot of the other judges, we have good people in the system that are trying their best. Uh, to make an imperfect system is, is understanding they're never going to make it perfect. Uh, you're going to read things and you're going to hear things, but just know that the people that are there every day that are involved, they're doing their absolute best to make this system run as smoothly and efficiently and most importantly, as fairly as it possibly can. I uh, say those are my my parting thoughts judge and i very much appreciate you having me down there it's been a great experience well, that's well said jim and i i appreciate you coming in i know you have a busy practice and gave up some time for our listeners and for me thank you not a problem at all sir thank you we've reached the end of this episode thank you so much for listening we'll be back in two weeks you've been listening to beyond the gavel with judge ron ranghell 
Join us in the next two weeks where we are educating the public and expanding mindsets. Head to our website, beyondthegavelpodcast.com, or your favorite podcast platform to subscribe to the latest episodes and updates.